Welcome everyone. We're going to give it a moment. Let everybody pop in. Let me see. I know people are coming. There we go. People are starting to pop on in. Going to give it one second. I'm going to share my screen. There we go. See, I have trouble. My chat doesn't always work. Okay. Eh, hang on a second. I'm going to try this again. Because I want to see all you coming on in. There we go. All right. Welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you all got the notice about the topic change today. Many of you signed up after we had already changed the topic. So hopefully this won't be a surprise for you. All right, so what we'd like to do, and first of all, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator for UVM Extension. I just popped into the chat. If anybody needs closed captioning today, just click on the link. And some of you have already started. You know the drill. We love to know who's here and who's joining us today. So I see that Emily's with us from Vermont. KL's here from Maryland. Michael, just so you know, we get youth from all over the country that participate. And so KL's a regular. Sage is from Maine. She's with us every week. Brooke and Jack and Simon are with us every week, which is great. Knight's here from Derby. And so if you haven't introduced yourself yet, just go ahead, pop it in the chat, because we do love to know. It's just a nice way to kind of get a sense of just our community who's here together. So as you all keep introducing yourselves, I am going to just remind you of our protocols when we are here in Zoom. So stay muted. Um, well, you all will be muted because you don't have the opportunity to unmute yourself. Um, but it doesn't mean we don't want you to participate. So we definitely want you to engage with our presenter. We want you to share your thoughts and your ideas and your questions. And there's two ways that we do these things. We have the chat box and we have the Q&A box and we use them very differently. The chat box is where you're going to respond to questions that the presenter has of you and um, as an opportunity to sort of have a back and forth conversation with the presenter. But if you have questions for our presenter, you're going to put those in the Q&A box and we will get to those questions throughout the presentation. And we always make sure to answer every question before we sign off. So we ask that you be courteous and respectful of one another. So, you know, what that basically means is don't create any distractions. And the biggest and really the only way that you can create a distra distraction is just using the chat box inappropriately. So if you start, um, you know, really being off topic in the chat box, I'll call you out. Um, you all are usually really good about um, doing that. Uh, okay, Jack, thank you. Just, just come on back in. Um, so just engage, participate fully. I know today is going to be a great cafe. I'm looking forward to it. So let's just, I just want to remind you all that we do have some other programs. So today is the last day of our winter series of the Teen Science Cafes. And next week, there is no cafe. We're taking a week break. And then we're coming back and starting the spring series. And the spring series is going to go from March 31st all the way to June 16th. And so the flyer is already um, posted and you can already sign up for um, the sessions. Emily, I see you have a question. Um, as always, you are not on video for the Teen Science Cafe. The only videos that are on or able to be on are myself and our presenter. So you don't have the opportunity to see anybody. And really, you're just here to engage with our presenter. Okay, the other opportunity coming up is we have a new coding um, session, Learn to Code program. This time you're going to be using Scratch and learn about animation. So that is a six week session starting in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in learning anything about animation or a little bit about Scratch, um, sign up, it should be fun. 
I uh, want to remind you our friends in Maine have their Maine Teen Science Cafes. So they have a couple more and I'm thinking that they're going to be adding to their list. I haven't seen any new announcements, but they still have two weeks um, posted. So you can uh, participate in those if you want. And the link is here. So let's move on to today's presentation. Um, today we're going to be learning about data science and specifically how data shapes community development. Our presenter is Michael Mosier, and he is the coordinator for the Vermont State Data Center. And he's also a research specialist at UVM Center for Rural Studies. Michael has a degree in community development. And that basically is a very broad area of study that could really mean a lot of things. And I think he's going to tell us a little bit about that today. Um, but this line of study allows Michael to explore the ways in which our economy, the environment, governments, and organizations interact with and influence each other and people living in communities. Michael is particularly interested in working with data about communities to help us understand strengths and weaknesses so that we can work together to build strong, thriving communities for all. So let's all welcome Michael to our Teen Science Cafes. And uh, Michael, it is all yours. All right, thank you, Lauren, appreciate that. You're welcome. So I am sharing now, hopefully everyone can see my slides. Yep, we can. All right, great. Um, Welcome to everyone who's uh, listening and, and uh, participating today. I, I appreciate you all being here. Um, the uh, presentation is about community indicators or uh, community data. And it's, a, it's sort of focused on understanding some basic concepts around data analysis for community development and uh, gets into some of the details of, of some of those fundamentals and, and gets into the process that you might use to use indicators to um, advance your knowledge about a community. So it's pretty specific, um, but it, it is, uh, we use these community data and community indicators for a lot of different reasons and a lot of different places. So let's try to uh, highlight some of those now. So today the, the agenda, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the Vermont State Data Center. Um, tell you, and we'll talk about why community indicators exist, who uses them, what some of the common indicators are, and some common data concepts, as I mentioned, and we'll even get into analysis and reporting um, concepts as well. And if we have time, don't really need to do this, Lauren, it's up to you, but we could get into uh, looking at actual data, how to find the data online if we want, but probably won't have time for that today. Um, let's see, there we go. Okay, so the State, State Data Center Program, um, there, there's, I'm the coordinator for the Vermont State Data Center and I am one person that's part of a network of people across the country and, and across the territories in the US. Um, I'm, I'm the person that does this for the state of Vermont. There are state data centers all around the country and our job is to talk to folks about um, how to access and use census data um, and how to assist, and we also assist the Census Bureau in um, data collection efforts. We just are wrapping up the 2020 decennial census, which is the, the big data collection they do every 10 years. And uh, again, I help people access data. I also educate and, and out, do outreach about Census Bureau data and other data sets, community indicators, um, to help people understand where to find good data about their communities and, and how to use it. Um, I like to showcase um, this building. This is the US Census Bureau, uh, which is down in actually just outside of Washington, DC in Suitland, Maryland. And um, I, I like to highlight this because um, in this building, there's well over 4,000 people working every day although maybe not the past year or so. But um, there, are, there are people that are statisticians here, there are program managers, there are all sorts of data visualization scientists, all sorts of um, survey methodologists and all the support staff and support people that go into 
uh, large scale uh, federal programs to collect and analyze and push out data um, about the United States, about our states and our communities across the country. And so there, there's just so many different people doing so many different jobs here. And I, I like to highlight that because if you're interested in data or you're interested in uh, graphic design or you're interested in programming, there, there are so many different jobs um, that could be done just within the Census Bureau. The Census Bureau is our federal statistical agency for the entire United States. They collect data with all sorts of other agencies and entities with, within the federal government. And they have very particular um, privacy rules that they follow and statistical rules that they follow. And it's, it's just really neat to, uh, to see um, the machinery that takes place to produce um, you know, basically a population number for any state or any county or any town. And these are folks that are just in the main offices. But for instance, in Vermont, we're, we're a very small state, uh, one of the smallest by population and by size uh, in the country. And, and at any given time in Vermont, there's around 50 people from the Census Bureau working in the state of Vermont who live and work here. And so there's, there's people that are knocking on doors and, and asking people to contribute their information uh, you know, and, and contribute data on a regular basis. So again, lot, lots of neat opportunities within the Census Bureau and the federal government in this regard. So I'll start by asking this question, uh, why community indicators? You know, why, why do we need indicators about our communities? You know, what does that do for us? How do we use that information? I like to synthesize that question into two primary responses, which is that we like to um, use community data or community indicators to help us understand the story of our communities. And um, I'll, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. We also use community indicators to help us make decisions. Um, and so data can uncover interesting trends and challenges and uncover opportunities or strengths about our communities. And the only way to know, to really know these things and to make informed decisions is to actually have the data, be able to access it and use it in, a, in, in various ways. So the next question is who uses community indicators? And there are lots of different people that are using data on a, on a regular basis. And they include folks like community planners and municipal officials. They include people like policymakers and politicians. So, so government folks, people that work for our states and people that work for the federal government and the local government. They include businesses. Businesses use data all the time. They use data to understand where they might be able to sell the products that they're making. They use data to understand where their employees might come from and how they can reach out and, and access the best kinds of employees that they need to do the work that they have. Um, nonprofit organizations and, and government agencies use data all the time. They use community indicators to understand what the needs are of a community and how they can best serve a community if they're providing services, uh, for instance, to people who are experiencing homelessness. You can't adequately provide services unless you know how many people are experiencing homelessness in a place, for instance. And then of course, there's students and researchers who are always using community indicators and data and just private citizens as well who may be interested in learning more about their community and understanding how their community compares to another community or how their community has changed over time. And some of the most common community indicators include things like population counts. What's the age of a community? What are the age groups in a community? Is a community getting older or younger? Um, how, how is the the race and ethnic makeup of a community different in one place than in another place? Um, and what's the well being of a community? These are general sort of population level indicators. 
We also have indicators about our economy. What's the unemployment rate? How many people are participating in the workforce? What are the wages? Are people making good wages in one place compared to another? Um, and you, I'm sure you've all heard some of this in the news or online or, or recently. Um, there's a lot of interest in uh, people getting back to work. There's a lot of interest in uh, creating a livable wage, increasing the minimum wage up to $15 an hour from where it's at now. Um, other economic indicators, what are the jobs? What industries are um, increasing in a place or what jobs are not um, needed in a place? Again, that goes back to some businesses that might be interested in those, in, in those indicators. Uh, housing indicators include indicators about housing affordability. Can people actually afford to pay rent or a mortgage in, in a place? Can they afford to live in, in a community? How many owners there are? How many renters? What's the value of a property? How many properties are empty? These are really great indicators. And I'll, I just want to mention that indicator really means to indicate, right? So some of these things, they, they tell us something's going on. If you have a lot of homes that are vacant in a place and the value of the homes is really low compared to other places, that's a story that we're learning about a community. And I'll go into that some more. Other indicators include things like um, income indicators around median income, how many people are receiving income assistance, how many people are below the poverty threshold, things like that. And, and those are really important indicators, obviously. And then natural and built environment indicators like What's the land use in a community? Is this an agricultural community? Is this a, a primarily a suburban residential community? Um, how, have, how have our communities changed over time? Have they become more agricultural or, or less agricultural? And, and what's, what activities are going on on the land? So these are all uh, interesting indicators that um, folks are using all the time to help them, again, tell the stories and make decisions uh, in their jobs. Are there any questions about um, basically sort of the top level community indicators or any of these things that I've just mentioned? Um, feel free to type something in the chat. Lauren will read it out to me if, if there's anything that's pressing that anyone wants to talk about right now. So there is always a lag. Um, between sure. typing and something popping up. So we'll just give it a moment. Absolutely. Anyone has any questions on this yet? I'll just go back and review. These are the folks using community indicators. And I don't see anything in the chat yet. So okay. I think we're probably okay. I will move forward. So now I'm going to get into some of the uh, more basic data concepts. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna step back for a minute, and and I, I should add a slide about this. Actually, there there's a couple of different ways to think of a community. Um, there's communities of place, and there's communities of interest, and I'm really focused on communities of place in this presentation. So a community of place is a community that's defined by geography, by people physically in a space together, whether that's at the town level or in a village or in a county or in your state or in the United States, okay? That, those are communities of place and those are geographic units of analysis. There's also communities of interest and, that's, uh, and those are comprised of people who have a comp, like I said, a common interest in something. Um, we're really focused on communities of geography, communities of place for this presentation. And when we think about communities of place, we think about the every individual represents a unit of analysis. So every person, every every person on the you know that's listening in today, has data that represents them. Um, we all have a place that we live in. We all have. Uh, certain uh, characteristics that define that are defined by who we are, and that's the individual unit of analysis. That's not really 
important to anyone outside of yourself or ourselves though. And what we do to um, build up our analysis is we start to begin to look at communities like the town level, okay? So we aggregate up from the individual level to the town level and from the town or village level or, or what have you. And from that level, we can aggregate up again, a group of communities into a county level or a parish level. And a parish is another name. It's the equivalent of a county. Probably don't have anyone from a parish state here, but I think there's only like two states that have parishes. Um, and then we can again, aggregate up that unit of analysis up to a regional level, like the Northeast New England or the Southwest or the Northwest of the country. Um, we can, we can, and actually those should be in the, those should be in different places. We would aggregate up to the state level first and then to a regional level. And then we can also aggregate up to the national level of the United States. So we can be talking about what's the population of the US. We can be talking about the poverty rate in the United States. We can also talk about the poverty rate at the state level. We can talk about poverty rates in our towns. And we can also talk about, um, we can aggregate up again to the sort of the global level if we want to. And most often people hear about global population, things like that. Some more indicator data concepts. Um, there's two types of data that, um, well, this is, this is one way to think about data indicators. Primary data, and these are just terms that you may hear about or, or may not have heard about, but you may, you may end up hearing about them. It's just good to have sort of in, in the back of your toolbox somewhere. Uh, primary data is data that you collect. And the reason I cover this is because I spend a lot of time collecting data and that's primary data. Secondary data is data that's not collected by you. It's data that you're using from the Census Bureau or from some other source. And that's really what we're focused on today is the secondary data. Um, data that you're going to access and use to understand your community or, or this, the country or whatever it is you're interested in learning more about. Some other data concepts, there's subjective data and there's objective data. I know this is maybe very academic and a little dry, so I apologize, but um, I, I just like to share these concepts because I think they're basic concepts and they're really important to just have, again, in, in the back of your mind. Subjective data is data that is um, collected um, from individuals in the population. And it's, it's really about your feelings and your attitudes and your impressions. It's, if I were to ask you how anxious you feel about your finances or how, how safe and secure you feel on a regular basis. That's subjective, it's, it's your feelings, how you feel about something uh, as compared to something like objective data, which is data that's collected about the population. It's, it's not about how, how the population, how individuals feel, it's about those sort of harder, more tangible characteristics that we are defined, that define who we are. So, Again, how many people are in poverty is the equivalent of how do you feel about your finances? It's not an equivalent, but um, it's an objective measure of your financial situation versus a subjective measure, which is how you feel. Some other data concepts, quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative data is numbers, data with numbers, it's a tabulation, it's an aggregation of the attributes or characteristics. So it includes things, quantitative data includes things like counts, ranges, rates, medians, means, et cetera, things like that. Qualitative data is data that is more text-based, it's descriptive, it's individual level data, it's collected through interviews and observations. So for instance, quantitative data is the number of people that live in a place, that's quantitative data. Qualitative data is, you know, how do those people feel about where they live? How do they feel about the, the place that they live in? Let's ask them all that question and let's 
let's find let's find how people feel on that you know and and we can we can turn that qualitative data into something we can quantify it if we need to but we're asking a question that's a little bit more subjective than than just pure numbers data um when we are analyzing data there are some common terms and common tools that we use to analyze data. These include things like the median, the mean, the mode, the percentage, a rate, ranking, and comparative and longitudinal analysis. Now, probably most of you are familiar with most of these terms. Um, and I'm not gonna go into them too deeply other than to really go into the comparative and longitudinal analysis, because I think that's where the, these concepts right here is where we get into how do we tell the story that the, or how do we express the story that the data are telling us, all right? Are there any questions uh, so far about analysis concepts, some of the concepts that I mentioned? some of these tools that we can use to analyze data and, and understand a community? There is one question in the Q&A and why sure. if people have questions about anything so far, you can pop in the chat or the Q&A while we just answered this question. Kale's wondering, are there any um, ethical pledges that data scientists make similar to like pledges medical practitioners or lawyers have to make? Great question. That is an awesome question um, and, and perfect. Um, so whenever I collect data for my job, I have to abide by the rules of the institution, the University of Vermont, where I work. And I have to take a test and, um, you know, adhere to specific rules uh, for data research, absolutely, for, for human subjects research. The Census Bureau has those same rules. Uh, they have very stringent rules. Uh, one of their most important rules is that the data that they collect about us as Americans, as people living in this country, is protected by law, is protected by the Constitution. It's not allowed to be accessed in a way that would allow someone else to under, to identify you by the data that the Census Bureau collects. And that's really important. And that's been tested in the Supreme Court and it's proven to hold up. So when the Census Bureau comes to your house or when some other federal agency comes to your house and asks wants to ask you questions about your income and your race and your ethnicity and how many people are under age 18 in your home and what's, you know, all these very sort of sensitive uh, questions about your, your, your personal household, all of those data, all of that data is protected as soon as it comes out of your mouth, as soon as you answer online or in person, those data are protected, they're locked up, and they, they cannot be shared and in any way that is um, that could uh, be used against you as a person, as an individual, and that's really important. So that's that's a great question. Um, I, I don't usually talk too much about this, but I, I will sort of juxtapose that level of security with the other kinds of data that um, are collected about us. And just briefly, every you all should know this. Every time you get on your computer, every time you get on your phone, every time you make a purchase online or a purchase at the grocery store using a credit card or debit card, all of those data points, all of that is represented, all of those things are data points. So every time you know a cookie is collected from your web browser or you make a purchase or whatever, that is data that is collected about you. And um, the credit card companies and they buy and sell your data. They sell information about you. They aren't really interested in you as an individual. Um, they're interested in you as a consumer as, from a group of consumers, but those data are not, they do not 
those companies do not adhere to those high ethical standards. <laughs> and so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, not that we really have a choice, right? Because we need to buy things and we, unless you can live off cash, um, there's gonna be data out there about you. Um, so there's definitely a, a continuum of um, sort of that, that ethical piece to the data. Are there any other questions, Lauren? We are good for now. Okay, all right. So again, these are some of the basic analysis tools here, and I am going to go into comparative and longitudinal analysis um, right now, as a matter of fact. So indicator analysis, a number by itself doesn't tell us much. So analysis, those analysis techniques provide the context. They help us to tell the story or to tell the story that the data is telling us or wants to tell us. And there's two primary forms of community data analysis. These are the ones I like. Um, and they are longitudinal or trend analysis, looking at the, what's happening over time and comparative analysis. Com and that's exactly what it sounds like. And I'm gonna give some examples of these, all right? So this presentation is out of Vermont. So for those of you that aren't in Vermont, I apologize, but you have to look at my little tractor going across the field there. Hopefully it's moving. Um, trend analysis, the number of farms in Vermont in 2017 was 6,808. That is the number all by itself, right? What does that tell us? So what? What does it mean? It doesn't really, doesn't really tell me anything. I have nothing, I have no context to understand that number. And so I need to do either some longitudinal or some comparative analysis. And here is just an example of looking at the number of farms in Vermont over a, a fairly lengthy period of time. And um, this is not any like crazy change, anything drastic or anything like that, but it helps us to understand that story and to tell that story a little bit more. And so we could see here that in 2017, there were almost 7,000 farms. Um, but that's actually increased uh, since, you know, um, 1992 and earlier. And actually we've seen some, we've seen in increases and decreases in recent history. Um, and, and there's a story there, okay? And for people who are interested in farming and agriculture and, and understanding, um, you know, what's happening with farming in, in your state or in your community, um, looking at the number of farms over time is really uh, a useful way to, to begin understanding the story that the data are telling us. And comparative analysis helps us to understand what, that, what the number of farms means for places. So we, we can look at the trends, but then we might want to understand where the farms are in Vermont, right? Because Maybe there's not so many farms in some places, and maybe there's a lot of farms in other places, right? So that's a comparative analysis, helping us to see where the farms are in Vermont. And this is really, and again, these are all data visualizations, just to point that out. People say, use the term data visualization. They're talking about charts, graphs, maps, um, and you can make them fun or you can make them simple. I'm a pretty simple guy, so my visualizations stay pretty simple. But here's a visualization of the farms in Vermont by every county, okay? And this is very telling, and this is a real useful visualization because it not only is it just the numbers in a table, right? But it gives us that scale, that sense of scale of understanding that wow, there's just a ton of farms in Franklin County compared to the number of farms in say Essex or Grand Isle, okay? And that's really important. Um, this visualization, these numbers with this visualization can help us to understand, um, again, the example would be maybe there's a policymaker that's looking to understand where they can have the most impact on farming in the state of Vermont. Well. Maybe they want to focus their energy where the most farms are, 
or, and, and maybe they wanna to talk to the most farmers in, in these counties, right? Or maybe they wanna understand why there's so few farms here. Now I have to say Grand Isle, if you know Vermont at all, it's a very small physical place. So that's why there's relatively small, fewer farms there. And that's something else to take, to take into account. One thing you might do is you might um, go further with this analysis and use one of the other tools that I mentioned and look at the number of farms per acre of, of land in a county and create a rate or create a, some sort of system that would equalize out some of this data story and tell a little bit more and, and give a little bit better um, perspective on this data story. So again, this is a simple example, but you could go more in depth with it. Now, I'm just checking for time here because I wanna make sure I don't go over. Oh, we're good, okay. So, um, so again, longitudinal and comparative analysis, those are really basic, straightforward things that you can do to understand the context of your community if you're looking at understanding your community more. Um, uh, before, I, before I go there, I, I think the other example I'd just like to give, just talking sort of off the cuff, um, really great way to understand your community is to compare it against the United States or the state that the community's in or the county that the community's in. So, um, you know, when we talk about an indicator, something like maybe poverty rate, um, we might say, and I think the poverty rate in Vermont is somewhere around 10 or 12%. Again, that doesn't really mean much. Um, I mean, it, it means that 10 or 12% of our population is, is suffering and it, it, you know, is below the federal poverty threshold and, and requires, you know, um, a, a unique perspective to address those cha that challenge that they're experiencing. But when you look at the poverty rate in Vermont and you compare that to say the poverty rate of the United States, you'll find that Vermont's poverty rate is actually a lot lower than that of the United States overall. And so that helps you to understand that while we have 10 or 12% of our population that's below poverty, we actually are better off than some other places in the country. And that's important to keep in mind. It gives you that perspective again, that comparative analysis. So I apologize, my dog is barking in the background. You just have to deal. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm going to, does anyone have any questions, I guess, first of all, about comparative analysis or longitudinal analysis, looking at data over time or looking at data, comparing places or, or anything like that before I move on? There are no questions at this time. So I would say okay. if you have a question, pop it in the Q&A and we'll come back to it. So, um, now I just want to talk briefly about data reporting, uh, which is, you know, once you understand, um, once, once you've accessed some data, once you've pulled some data down and you've used it to look at a community or a place or a community of interest and, you, and you, you've found a story that's interesting, then you may want to tell that story to others, right? You might be telling, you might be, someone who's working for a nonprofit organization, and you might wanna tell the story to uh, a potential funder. You might wanna tell a data story about people in need that you wanna serve with your organization. And you wanna tell that story to someone who might fund your activities for your nonprofit. You might also wanna tell that story to a politician so that they pass legislation that will address the needs of the, of the community that you're that you're telling the story of, all right? So there's, there's a lot of different um, examples of how um, folks that use data will, will tell a story with those data. And some of the things that are important to keep in mind is that um, you need to consider the audience when you tell the story. Um, who are you talking to? What, what do they, what is their need? What, what's gonna interest them the most? something to just kind of keep in the back of your mind. You wanna tell a compelling story. Um, you don't wanna tell a boring data story 
if, if there's no story there, then there's no story there, then that's fine. And maybe that's compelling, it might be, but you have to consider, you make considerations for that as well. Be creative. I used a little moving image of a tractor on a field and that probably caught someone's attention. I like it. Um, so don't be afraid to be a little creative when you tell your data story. Use those data visualizations, okay? Use bright colors. Make sure that your data visualizations are accessible. And that has to do with people that may not see colors as you know the same way that you do. Um, provide context. That is again, sort of thinking about not just telling someone a number, but helping them to understand how that number compares to other numbers or how that place compares to other places or how that's changed over time. Please also keep your data story simple, okay? You don't want to overwhelm folks with too much information all at once because um, they'll shut down and they'll forget the thing that's most important that you were trying to tell them. So if you can, if you can, um, if you could tell a data story and focus on three data points at most or five at most, that's more than enough. Five is more than enough. Try to repeat one thing three times. That's probably the best way to go if you're trying to tell a data story. I have an example report here, but I'm, I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna share that right now, um, but I will uh, just go along. I wanna, I provide this slide because I just want you all to see uh, how many different places you can go to to find out data about your community or about a place that you're interested in learning more about. Um, it's important to understand that um, every state has um, a housing uh, agency and state government or a nonprofit organization that will have housing data. Every place, and, and a lot of cities have that, and, and some towns even. Um, every state is going to have a Department of Labor. Every state's going to have a Department of Health. There's going to be health data out there. There's going to be employment data out there. There's going to be information about the natural resources in your community or in your state, um, educational information as well. And so these are all examples that are local to the state of Vermont. But they really are, are examples that can be found in any state or in many cities or larger, larger communities across the country. And so I, that may be one of the biggest challenges in accessing data is that there's, there can be a lot out there and it can be challenging to understand what's, what's good data and what's bad data. If you ever see something that says US Census Bureau, that's the gold standard of data. And, and you can be assured that it's, um, as long as it's being represented correctly, that it's, it's good data. Um, and some of the Census Bureau data resources um, include some of, these, some of these websites that you can go to. Uh, you can go and get business data from a, a website. You can get all sorts of census data from data.census.gov. You can get visual data about um, where people live and work at this site on the map. And I'll just briefly, um, now I'm overwhelming you all, so I'm going against what I just said about keeping it simple, but um, I did want to, I just did want to highlight that um, if you go to data.census.gov, that's really sort of like the best place to start to find data. I mean, you can Google it too. That's always fun. And you're gonna get data that's repackaged from the Census Bureau oftentimes. Um, but data.census.gov has just all this information. Whoops. Um, it has social indicators, housing indicators, business, business data and manufacturing data. It has information about governments, and that's like your town government and where town governments and state governments are spending their money. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it has information about um, commodities going in and out of our country and in and out of our states. So if you're interested in milk production or maple syrup or cheese or um, grains or 
you know, I guess those are all agricultural commodities, but there's, there's plenty of other uh, widgets and things that are produced and, that you can learn about through the Census Bureau. Um, there's very detailed industry and business data. If you wanna know who owns businesses and what businesses are operating in your state or in your place and, and what kinds of people, are they male owned and operated? Are they female? Are they, are they jointly male and female owned and operated businesses? Are they operated by uh, veterans? Are they operated by someone of color? These, these are all data that are available and, and help us to understand what's going on in our communities. And again, there's also these estimates of population that um, help us to see what might happen um, in the future. So um, that's most of my presentation, as you can see. Um, and um, I would welcome any additional questions. I could tell you a little bit about myself if you'd like me to, Lauren, uh, whatever uh, folks would be interested in, or, or you can run your... Yeah, so before we go to questions, I am just gonna pop a poll up if you all could just answer the two questions. And then if you have any questions for Michael, pop them into the chat. But once we're done with the poll, Michael, I would love it if you could just kind of tell these guys, what, what, what was the path you took to, you know, why did you go to school for community development? Where did you go to school? And then, you know, how did you land in the job that you have right now? Um, I always think it's fascinating to know where did you start from to how did you get here? <laughs> all right, I'm going to close the poll. Thank you all for doing that. And again, put your questions in the Q&A. But Michael, if you could just kind of give us a, a little sense on where you came from to get where you are today. Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so um, I'm a Vermonter. Um, I have, am deeply rooted in this state. Um, and I, I care very much about it. Um, I, I left Vermont when I got out of high school and I know you're all uh, in high school and I would highly recommend that you leave the place that you grew up in at least for a little bit of time, if not for longer, whatever suits you. You don't have to, but I'll tell you, it gives amazing perspective to leave the place that you know and to go out and try living somewhere else and doing and living your life and being who you are in another place away from what you know. Um, that's a really uh, eye-opening experience and it can really help you as a person understand where you wanna be for the future. And that's what happened to me. I left Vermont. Um, I didn't last long, I was only gone three years. And then I came back. I went and I lived in Boston for a couple of years and I traveled around the country and I went to Europe even. I was very privileged to be able to do all those things. And, um, you know, I, I, I came back here. Um, I, I just, you know, it's, it's a special place and I, I knew I wanted to be here. The longer I was away, the more I recognized how, how special it was for me. Um, I came back to Vermont. I, finished up a couple of years of, of college at UVM, University of Vermont. And I was just taking classes, uh, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I, I knew that Vermont was really special to me and I knew that I wanted to uh, contribute to keeping it special somehow. And I didn't know what that meant um, until I started taking classes in the Community Development and Applied Economics Department at the University of Vermont where I realized that a lot of the work that they were doing was about understanding the challenges that communities face and helping people to fix the challenges and also looking at the strengths of our communities and building on those strengths. And that was very, very interesting to me. And so I, I took a, a lot of classes in community development, applied economics, got a degree in that. And, um, I've been working at the university since then in this place called the Center for Rural Studies, where we help organizations and we help state agencies and we help nonprofits and businesses to understand the communities that they are working in and to understand uh, the challenges and the opportunities that our communities face. 
And for me, it's, it's, I, I feel like one of the luckiest workers around in that I get to feel, I feel so good about the work that I do every day because I'm helping others to help, help organizations and help communities. And by providing them with data, by helping them think about uh, communities and, and understand how to, how to get into a community and do the kind of work within a community that will help strengthen the community. And I, I, I do, I, I feel really lucky that I get to do that work. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's sort of a vague uh, degree, you know, it's not really any one thing specifically. Um, it's, it's kind of holistic is a good word for it. Looking at the bigger picture and trying to understand how all the pieces of a community fit together, whether it's an economic piece or a social justice piece, or an environmental quality piece. Um, you know, they all, all of those different pieces, um, they all overlap and they all interact with each other and they all impact each other. And I, I think that's probably the heart of community development work right there is understanding those overlaps and all those interconnections and, and um, working to address challenges using strengths and, um, and building from those strengths. And so um, that's sort of you know, where I came from. I originally went to school for, uh, for film <laughs> uh, down in Boston. I was studying film. I really, I, I love the idea of communication and I, I'm doing that now in a way that um, I really enjoy. I'm, I'm telling people stories and I'm helping communicate and educate and do outreach. And, and that's really ultimately what I wanted to do. Um, but it, it took me a while to get there and, and, and that's okay too. <laughs> Love it. The story of the winding path. It's usually yes, the winding path and not the straight path. Just so you all know, it's, I think for those of you who've come to a lot of teen science cafes, you, you've heard from a lot of presenters that the path is usually not linear, but where you end up is usually You've had a lot of fun and a lot of interesting experiences along the way. So I don't see any other questions that have come in. So let's all thank Michael for sharing his work with us today. Um, it's really exciting to you know, get to see sort of the social science side of science, because um, a lot of times we don't necessarily think of the social sciences when we talk about science cafes. So it's really nice to be able to showcase that Science is a very, very broad field and you can do really cool things like community development using all the data science. So thanks for joining us today, everyone. Remember, we're taking a week off and we'll resume with our spring series on March 31st. So get signed up and I hopefully we will see you then. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks everyone.